I'm going to talk to you about the Bohr and the Schrodinger model of the atom. Uh, by the way, I'm probably saying it wrong. I'm not German. So uh, how do you say this one here? I think it's got the umlauts on it. I think they call it like Schrodinger, I think is what a German says. Uh, I can probably pronounce Bohr right, or at least close to it, because uh, I live in Denmark and uh, Niels Bohr was uh, a Dane. So let's talk about the Bohr model of the atom. There's a lot of different ways of looking at the atom. His way, I mean, there's a lot of other things based on this, but the stuff you need for the IB is this, that the electrons in the hydrogen atom, uh, they have stable orbits. So what that meant is, see, um, if you did the math before this atom, it would say that as they were just orbiting around, they should give off radiation, therefore their orbits should sort of degrade. His thing said, no, 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 they can be stable, they can be happy where they are, no problem there. Next thing, um, this whole thing we've been talking about before, that the electrons can go up or down in orbit um, based on these quantized numbers of, of energy. So this could be this E equals HF. And of course, they emit radiation when they go down. This is this whole idea about these uh, energy levels when they go up and they go down and they emit a photon. And that we know. Now, the other thing he said was this, the angular momentum of the electrons, that's quantized in integer amounts of H over 2 pi. So what does this mean? This is actually an equation on your data booklet. I haven't seen them really use it much on exams, but I mean, hey, it's in the syllabus, they've added it, so uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this shows up, at least in an easy way to explain it. I think what would help to know is this, when you talk about angular momentum, it's a little bit cheap because you know you don't do so, so much of it in uh, IP physics, but this is the angular momentum right here, this first part. This is the angular momentum. And if you're going to say that the angular momentum is quantized in integer amounts of h over 2 pi, what that means is it only comes in numbers of this. So you've got h over 2 pi, and notice what n is. n is just an integer. That's why it's integer amounts. So for example, let's just say you have uh, the angular momentum is equal to 1 times h over 2 pi. That's allowed. Or it could be 2 times h over 2 pi, or 3, or so on. So n is just these integers, positive uh, 1 and higher. So we talk about these different things. This is the mass of the electron. That is measured in kilograms. You can look it up. What is it? 9.11, I think, times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, something like that. Speed of the electron will be in meters per second. We have radius of the orbit. That should be in meters, I would guess. Uh, this is just an integer number, so they have no units, and h is just a constant. That's the one at 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Again, look it up. So this, I don't know what really they could ask you other than just, you know, fill in N and M and maybe what's V or what's R or what's M or what's N. They won't ask you for H because H is known. But other than that, they could ask you one of these variables by uh, and uh, not give you the other ones. So here we have orbital energy. This is another thing uh, that came from the Bohr model of the atom. He was looking at this especially, this is for hydrogen, by the way. This is, this is for hydrogen. So for the simplest atom, the nice simple one, he said that En, where n is just a subscript, it's just a, it's an integer. Again, it could be one, two, three, four. He just said the energy of um, the uh, nth orbit, so the energy of this electron in this orbit, will be given by minus 13.6 divided by n squared. So for example, if you have n equals 1, then it's just minus 13.6 over n. And by the way, uh, so this over 1. Or if it's over 2, then it's 13.6 over 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. So you have 13.6 over 4. That's the next one, and so on. So En is the energy of the nth orbit, but it's important it's in electron volts. And maybe it's a good idea to just do this question here, so just to have a little bit of practice. This is an exam kind of question. So we have an electron in a hydrogen atom. It's excited up to the third orbital radius number. That means now it's at N equals 3. If that makes any sense? Uh, then it undergoes a transition down to the ground state. What does that mean? Ground state is n equals 1. Not 0, but 1. So now it goes from n equals 3 to n equals 1. What's the wavelength of that photon? Well, what we can do is we can find out what's E3. In other words, what's the energy of the third orbit? Let's see, it's minus 13.6 over 3 squared. Well, that's minus 13.6 over 9. Let me figure that out. So we have 13.6 over 9. So that gives me a um, negative 1.51 electron volts. Okay, great. Let's do E1. What's that give me? Well, that's negative 13.6 again. Now we have to have like before. We divide that by 1 squared. And 1 squared is just 1, so that means it just gives me a value of 
negative 13.6 EV. So now we have E3 and E1. And I hope it makes sense. We have to do delta E. So that's just going to be these two subtracted. Right? So uh, we just need to know the difference, right? So 13.6 minus 1.51. I'm just doing the absolute value here. We end up with what? 12.09 electron volts. Um, so I think that's actually pretty uh, interesting here. We've got this uh, energy now in electron volts. Now, what do we do with this? If we want this wavelength, um, what can we do? We need a wavelength here. Do you remember what we can do for EE? This is, this is the energy we're looking at in electron volts. We could first convert it to joules if we wanted to. So we can get rid of the electron volts. So that means we have 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules for every electron volt. So let me try that. So I'll multiply my answer by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. Whoops. What did I do? Times, uh, yep, times 1.6. So my calculator is doing something really strange. There we go. So now I have my delta E in joules is 1.9 times 10 to the minus nine, uh, 18 joules. Why do I need that number? Well, because I want the wavelength. Remember, E equals HF. And if you remember your equations, um, remember C equals F lambda. That's your wave equation. If you want to get F by itself, you can say F equals C over lambda. So that means everywhere I see an F, I can write it with HC over lambda. And if I want to solve for lambda, fine. Lambda equals, um, this would be HC divided by E. If I just move the lambda over and I move the HC, I move the E down. All right, so let's put in the numbers. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 times C, which is 3 times 10 to the 8. All that divided by the energy in joules, which is 1.9 times 10 to the minus 18. Let's try this out. I'm going to save that answer. So 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. Oops. Something wacky up on my screen there. There we go. Times 3 times 10 to the 8. All that divided by my answer that I just got, right? So 1.9 times 10 to the minus 18. If I do this, I end up with a wavelength of uh, 1 point, let's say, oh, actually, times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Um, what that means, this is 100 nanometers, you could say. So this right here is something that uh, is probably not something we're going to measure with our eye, at least. We certainly won't see this. This is way beyond uh, ultraviolet ultra for the eye, so we won't notice this. But it's about 100 uh, nanometers, or 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. So something like this, that should help. Now, uh, I want to talk to you very quickly about the Schrodinger uh, model of the atom. His idea was really brilliant. He said, okay, uh, we can't know everything in quantum mechanics, but let's write a wave function. Uh, they call it uh, psi, this little sort of symbol like that, uh, to represent everything you can know about your system. So what you basically do is put in all the stuff. It's almost like a big sort of mixing pot. You just sort of mix it all up, and then you end up with what you can do. It's basically, it's a mathematical equation. I mean, there's this whole thing called the Schrodinger equation. Um, it's a little bit complicated. It's beyond what we need for the IB. It's a great equation. I've taken a few classes and we played around with it a lot to try to find out what kind of solutions do you get? What does it do? Uh, and one of the things that it does that's useful, so by the way, the good news is you don't have to work with that equation because it's super gross, uh, especially for IB level. But if you know this, this is the one thing you're supposed to know, that the probability of finding an electron in a small volume is equal to basically the amplitude of your wave function which is what this is. So this is the amplitude of that psi here, squared times your small volume. Now, what does this really do? I mean, the, this is just an equation, right? I mean, you could be asked this. I've seen this show up a few times on exams. They ask you, like, what's the meaning of, uh, you know, psi squared? And you say, oh, it's the probability of finding something there. That's the most other thing they need you to know. The most important sort of um, uh, result from quantum mechanics from all this stuff is that the universe is no longer uh, sort of deterministic. In other words, it doesn't matter. Even if you know all the physics and all the rules, you can't actually predict everything's gonna happen. Turns out the universe is probabilistic. In other words, um, it's like there's just like rolling the dice. It turns out anything is possible. Uh, it just depends on if you observe it, then you force that thing to have happened. So that's actually related to the, it's called the Copenhagen interpretation that's related to Bohr's idea of the atom. This idea that, um, 
any possibility is possible, except when you actually observe it, then you force it to be just one thing. That sounds a little bit dodgy. And he got sort of a lot of flack from people about his cat. He just came up with this idea about a cat, about, you know, you could devise some sort of experiment. You have a box and you can't see anything. You have this devised experiment uh, that, you know, could randomly, basically, through absolute random chance, kill a cat. Obviously, he didn't kill any real cats. People freak out because they haven't read it. Um, so he didn't have anything against cats. That's why I like this Schrodinger, uh, sorry, wanted, dead and alive. Because this is the whole idea is that before you make the observation, all the states are possible. The cat could be dead in the box, you know, that you can't see. The cat could be alive. It could be dead and alive. It turns out it could be in another universe. Who cares? But what happens is when you open up the box, you make an observation on the system, you force all the other probabilities to collapse to nothing, and you end up with the one result, either the cat's dead or it's alive. That's why... I love this very first picture here that I've shown you. The Schrodinger plates. Look, they're both broken and not broken until you open the door. Do you notice? It looks like they're about, basically as soon as you open the door, everything's going to break. So I thought that's actually pretty brilliant. So quantum mechanics does lead to some really weird stuff. It leads to the fact that the universe seems to be uh, probabilistic. It seems to be that it's just random chance. You just have to work out the probabilities of things happening, and then you figure out what's most likely going to happen. But weird things are possible, which I'll talk to you about in the next video.